Mary had a little man, man, man. The fall. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. She's bringing out people who are not interested in voting for either Trump or Biden. So the entire electoral pool has changed. And if it continues in, the, in this direction, you have to start to consider Democrats winning the Senate and Democrats winning the House. Oh! The actual people who are participating. She's got intensity now. She's got an intensity advantage. Huh. She's got a demographic advantage. Huh. And I haven't seen anything like this happen in 30 days in my lifetime. How big is that, mar that marginal extra voter that she's bringing in? I mean, how much does that change the pool? One percent, maybe two. That's it. But that's enough. Right. Can I just ask you, though, about the uh, veracity, frankly, of the polls right now? Because you go back and look, and there was an interesting report yesterday showing that if you look at where Donald Trump was in terms of what the, what the polling showed is back in 2016, yep. undercounted. You go even in 2020, undercounted. And so... You, know, you start to think about the, you know, margin of error situation where maybe she's up, you know, one or two percent. But, are, you know, is the Trump vote fully counted? But that's why my process is not just to do the numbers. It's also to do the focus groups, to listen, to understand why people feel this way. And now my groups are broken up by young women saying, I'm not voting for him anymore. Huh. Make no mistake, there are three attributes, three components. So you think it's a switch? It's not because it, you just said I'm not voting for them anymore. So you think they were voting for Donald Trump? They were, and now they're voting for Harris. The people who are undecided have all collapsed towards Harris. The people who are weak Trump have all collapsed towards undecided. It's this broad shift. I'm trying to do a focus group tonight mm -hmm. with undecided voters under the age of 27 for a major news outlet. And I can't recruit young women to this because they don't exist as undecided voters. <laughs> and the, the, you shift the demographics and you shift the entire outcome. There are issues, attributes, and the conditions of the country. The issues and conditions favor Donald Trump. He should be winning this election. But the attributes are so much in Harris's favor <laughs> that he's not that the very attributes that Trump offers, and the best example, you did the story on the UAW, why is Donald Trump saying publicly, I want to fire right. the same people that he's getting now, right. still getting, union members? It's ridiculous. It's as though he's lost control. Oh, it is? Uh, you, you suspect he's lost control, Frank Lons? You suspect he has? Uh, the man has no self-control. He has no impulse control. He has no ability to speak intelligently about policy. And J.D. Vance, the reason why no one can find a woman under the age of 27 who is undecided at this point in our American lives is because they, the Trump Vance ticket, are out there telling women that their only role is to be breeders. Breed for me. It's very, uh, you know, uh, Benito Mussolini, okay? And I know that the, uh, the, the people who are asked to define fascism for their audiences, when they look it up and read it to their audiences, mispronounce Mussolini's name, mispronounce fascism. They don't even know what they're for anymore. Uh, but the people who are running on the Republican ticket are very busy telling women what Mussolini told Italy. And that is, Mussolini said, the cemeteries are full, but the cradles are empty. Uh, Hitler did it too with uh, you know, um, the young German motherhood thing and uh, little awards and ribbons for having lots and lots of Aryan babies. This is white Christian nationalism. And people know, even if they don't know what it's called, even if they don't know what fascism is, even if they know this is dystopian, they know this is ugly, 
They know it doesn't favor them or anything that they would like to do with their lives. I remember, you know, when we were trying to have it all. And we were da, 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 juggling everything, trying to have it all. Now we can't. Now they say the only thing you can have is babies. That's what you can have. That's it. You are limited to that. And now he's downshifted into postmenopausal views of postmenopausal women. Uh, I mean, it, it's like, okay, so I'm haunted by Cam's call yesterday. By the way, Cam, I, I, I know your name now because he did buy a podcast. Good for you. But saying that I look like your grandma, haunting haunting me. If I retire, I want my whole audience to blame you. Blame you. You are embedded in my head. But anyway, J.D. Vance now also starts talking about postmenopausal women and that the only role that we have is babysitting. So I'm sitting here to prove him wrong is what I'm doing. I mean, this is crazy. This is madness. How did they think they're going to win an election? All right, so yesterday, Donald Trump had one job, one job and one job only, and that was to go out and give an economic speech about his policy uh, to bring America back again or whatever the hell he thinks he has the prescription for, right? He went out there, and he started on his uh, little economic speech, and in like 1.2 seconds, he went from zero to bitch is what he does is we're talking about a thing called the economy they wanted to do a speech on the economy a lot of people are very devastated by what's happened with inflation and all of the other things so we're doing this as a intellectual speech you're all intellectuals today <laughs> today we're doing it and we're doing it uh right now and it's uh, very important they say it's the most important subject i think crime is right there i think the border is right there for personally uh, we have a lot of important subjects because our country has become a third world nation. We literally are a third world nation. We're a banana republic in so many ways, and we're not going to let that happen Stop. because we're starting a free fall. Trashing my country, you interloper. He has no impulse control. He couldn't lay out an economic policy because, A, he doesn't have one. And, B, he felt like the only way that he could get applause in a 2,400-seat auditorium in Asheville, which is typically, uh, you know, pretty democratic in North Carolina. I know a lot of people don't suspect that that is so, but it is so. Uh, I, I, honestly, I, I have, I have, I've owned land in western North Carolina for about 25 years now, and I've never built upon it waiting and waiting for North Carolina to turn blue, you know, so that I could live there and, you know, have a little mountain home there. <laughs> but hasn't happened quite yet. Maybe this cycle it will because Idiot Boy went there, had to talk to 2,400 people and was supposed to lay out his economic policy, his economic vision, his economic views, his views on taxation, his views on how to tamp down inflation, his views on uh, job creation. And he ended up calling us a third world nation, a banana republic, and then making fun of Kamala's laugh. Over and over and over. He cannot stick to a script. Even when they write the policy for him, he doesn't understand what he's talking about. I think he feels like uh, the audience doesn't understand policy either, and that that is not the reason why they came to see him. They came to see him because he's a clown. And so he has to, you know, uh, run the, the, the clown show for them. He has to trash people, call them names, do the schoolyard bully routine. Other than that, he has nothing for you. He has nothing for you. And that's why he's in an auditorium with a capacity of 2,400 people, making fun of Kamala Harris, who has had rallies of 15,000, 10,000, 12,000 over there. Today, they just did it also in North Carolina. I mean, she's trolling him. And he is so triggered by her, so freaking triggered by her. But they had, uh, Biden and, and Kamala had a joint... Um, no, it wasn't North Carolina. It was uh, uh, Maryland. They had a joint appearance today, the two of them, okay? A joint appearance today. Because Donald Trump, the idiot, says Biden was, uh, you know, cooed by Kamala, and he's really angry. And, blow and none of that is true. And the two of them got out on stage today and, uh, you know, showed that they are devoted to each other. Friends for life forever. <laughs> Oh.
things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. I mean, he can't help himself. Kamala and Joe tried to take credit for $35 insulin. You know that. You know who did that. I did that. I did that. I did the insulin. I did the insulin. I did, I did it. I did the insulin. You did not do the insulin. To do the insulin, you needed legislation. To do the insulin, you needed a statute. To do the insulin, you needed a law. And you needed a law to change. You needed the law to change. You did not change the law. The law had to change in order for Medicare, uh-huh, which represents 66 million people, in order for Medicare to have the authority to negotiate with Big Pharma. Remember when uh, Bush did this thing and he put a big brick wall between Medicare and Big Pharma to protect Big Pharma's gouging, you know, uh, and said, oh, no, Medicare cannot negotiate with Big Pharma. They literally put that into a piece of legislation banning Medicare from negotiating with uh, Big Pharma, right? And then uh, here comes Joe Biden. Here he comes. Everybody hates him because, you know, he was too young when he was, uh, you know, a young man. Now he's too old because, uh, you know, he's the oldest president ever. Uh, But Joe Biden's elderliness actually made him uh, determined to lower prescription drug prices for Medicare, uh, people who earned, earned Medicare benefits by working and paying into it their entire lives. And now they're being gouged inside Medicare in uh, Medicare Part D, and Part D is not allowed to negotiate with Big Pharma, right? So they needed to pass a piece of legislation. You remember when it was called Build Back Better? Remember that? And they were making fun of it, uh, Build Back Better, Build Back And uh, you had, uh, you know, your uh, Joe Manchins and your Kirsten Cinemas uh, being very uh, contrarian and saying, no, no, it's too big, I don't want to do it. And she was all about protecting Big Pharma. And they had to split the bill. And they split the bill into the infrastructure package, remember that, and uh, the uh, recovery package. Well, the Inflation Reduction Act actually included the reversal in the law that was required so that Medicare could then negotiate with Big Pharma for the price that Medicare would pay for pharmaceuticals in Medicare Part D. So today, in Maryland, uh, Kamala and Joe Biden did a, a, a dual appearance. It was wonderful. It was uplifting. It was important. And it had a lot of policy in there. And uh, they explained it in a way that even I could understand it. We finally addressed the longstanding issue that for years was one of the biggest challenges on this subject, which was that Medicare was prohibited by law from negotiating lower drug prices. And those costs then got passed on to our seniors, but not anymore. (laughs) Two years ago, we gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prescription drug prices for the first time in history. And here is why that matters. It is nearly impossible for a patient to negotiate lower prices by themselves. Just think about that. Somebody who needs the medication, who may be suffering from a serious illness, that they would by themselves be able to negotiate against a big drug company to lower that prices is virtually impossible. It's one person against a huge corporation. But Medicare represents more than 65 million people. And so Medicare, has collective bargaining power. Hmm. And now Medicare can use that power to go toe to toe with Big Pharma and negotiate lower drug prices. Thank you, Joe. And that did happen, and uh, it's two years, it's been two years, and so now uh, we're ready to do uh, not just insulin, but 10 more drugs. You remember how this had to be phased in because Big Pharma was at the other end of the table there, and they had all these objections to just, uh, you know, going ahead and lowering prices. So they sat there, and they thought, hmm, 
So which drugs are about to have, you know, competition in the marketplace like generic that they uh, have outlived their patents? Now, when they're when they're, you know, uh, brand new drugs, when they're patented drugs and there's no competition for these drugs, that is when they gouge you. Supply and demand being what it is, right? When the supply is only coming from one company uh, for, let's say, um, you know, an arthritis medication like an Embryl, right? But Embryl's been on the market so long that it's now coming out of protection, right? And uh, generics can now be made uh, using the exact, uh, you know, uh, chemistry, the exact, uh, you know, um, equation. And so they sat there and they thought about all these drugs that are just coming into the marketplace uh, with generics. And they're like, okay, we made $8 billion a, a year off of uh, Xarelto. Or we made $9 billion a year off of Eliquis. Or we made $10 billion a year off of, a year off of Jardians, right? And how did they do it? They, they did it by overcharging you, right? Over, this is where the profit comes from. So they're like, okay, well, they'll be, they'll be generic. So uh, we'll uh, start, you know saying we can negotiate on the price of these, on the price of these. Because it's like, um, I don't know, Lunesta, uh, you know, it, it, it was very expensive. Uh, I, I love that pill. It's my favorite of all the pills. You take it, hour later, you're sleeping. Yay! Uh, but it used to be like really expensive. Now there's a generic for it, and it's like, uh, you know, uh, not even a dollar. <laughs> you know what I mean? So this is what's happening with all these drugs. So they have uh, negotiated the 10 new drugs that will come down in price. Uh, they will be capped for people in Medicare. And uh, they're working on getting uh, insulin capped for all Americans, for every American, not just Medicare uh, now. And, and insulin was one of the most grotesque. See, and the, and the reason why Donald Trump, he, I mean, look, he's a liar is what it is. The man just can't stop. He has no idea what his administration did on insulin. He has no idea what his administration did on anything, nothing. He, he doesn't care about policy. He doesn't understand it. He has no acumen for it. He, remember when the, he was getting uh, the intelligence briefings, the presidential daily briefing? He had to have it like uh, drawn for him. Do you know what I mean? He needed drawings. He can't, uh, he just can't absorb complex information. He can't absorb things with moving parts. The only thing that, that, that you know, um, uh, arouses him, the only thing that excites him is money, dollars. That's it. That's all. Making things better for you is not uh, anything he's interested in. Like, how could he profit off of it? Yeah, it would be, but not. So he lied. He just stood there and lied yesterday. Obviously, it was a lie because you had to have changed the law. In order. So what did he do on insulin? Just so we're real clear. Okay. He had um, a CMS uh, secretary. Her name was uh, v Vima Sima Verma. Sima Verma. She left in disgrace, okay? She left under investigation. She was trying to save her bacon, and she said to him, we should really reduce the cost of insulin because it doesn't cost anything to make, and they're charging, like, you know, $1,000 a month for a drug that costs them, like, $10 to make. You can sell that. Why don't you do that? It was a voluntary thing where certain health plans said, okay, we'll offer that. <laughs> Call in, connect. Speak to Randy. Call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. This wins this election. The result will be a Kamala economic crash, a 1929-style depression. 1929. <laughs> when I win the election, we will immediately begin a brand-new Trump economic boom. It'll be a boom. We're going to turn this country around so fast. I mean, he, he didn't even, uh, you know, like make a new script. It's, the, it's like it, he took Hillary's name out. He put Kamala's name in. And uh, he's saying the same thing, I, like making fun of the way Hillary laughs. Now he's making fun of the way Kamala laughs, right? I, I mean, it's... Fake economic plan this week probably will be a copy of my plan because of, <laughs> basically that's what she does. Just remember, she goes to work every morning in the West Wing. Her desk is 10 steps from the Oval Office. She cast the tie-breaking votes that gave us record inflation. And for nearly four years, Kamala has grackled as the American economy has burned. W what happened to her laugh? I haven't heard that laugh in about a week. That's why they keep her off the stage. 
That's why what? she's disappeared. Disappear. That's the laugh of a crazy person, I will tell you, if you haven't known it. It's a crazy. She's crazy. Talk about projection, man. Uh, it is unbelievable because uh, obviously inflation is way, way, way down. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act actually reduced inflation uh, the way it was supposed to. It also lowered drug prices. OK, it did do that. And he's lying. And uh, I mean, the, the, this is the same threat that he made about, uh, you know, if Hillary won, then we would uh, the stock market would crash. If Joe Biden won, that you'll see the stock market crash. Now, if Kamala wins, you're going to see the stock market crash. It'll be a 1929 stock market crash. A Great Depression will have it's the same damn thing it's the same damn thing i i just can't even believe it, it it's it, and he actually said this out loud yesterday the only reason the stock market is up is because people think i am going to win did you ever hear that no but there was one day a couple of weeks ago when they weren't thinking that and you saw what happened this will be a 1929 style crash he just walked himself into the truth about what happened last week and then decided to do a U-turn and go away. Because sometimes he finds himself telling a truth amongst the lies. And that can't happen. Yes. So I explained to you very uh, simply that there was something the Japanese did with the monetary policy in Japan that the markets didn't like. And so for one day, you saw the stock market uh, act very erratically. And, uh, you know, people were buying, uh, were selling off a whole lot of stuff because they were scared. They were, you know, freaked out. And so, uh, you, you know what? And also, uh, this is another thing that happened that week. Warren Buffett sold, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of shares of uh, Alphabet, you know, of uh, uh, Apple stock, I guess. Was it Apple stock? I think it was Apple stock, not Alphabet. It was Apple stock, right? He sold a whole bunch of it, and uh, people got spooked by that. Well, he probably understood what was going on with the Japanese monetary policy. Do you know what I'm saying? Anyway, uh, he started walking it. But again, it's a mixtape. It's plug and play. It's the same damn script. The man doesn't even care to attack his opponent uh, because he understands the downside to his opponent. It's just a generic slam. It's just a generic smear. And it's the same old crap over and over again, over and over and over again. And, you know, uh, even even Fox News, N Neil Cavuto, he's like, what, what is he talking about? The Donald Trump thing in the market amazes me. When they're up, it's all because of him and looking forward to him. When they're down, it's all because the Democrats and how horrific they are. <laughs> um, yet some of our biggest point fall offs, three of the biggest of the top ten, occurred during his administration. Now, a lot of those were in the COVID years. I get that. But, I, I, you know, you either own the markets or you don't. It, it does confuse me. It doesn't confuse you. You know he's a liar. He's a, he's a blamer. He's a, a projection, a, a projectionist. He's extremist. He, he, he takes credit for other people's work. That's why I did the insulin. And then start saying, you know, Kamala's going to come out with her economic plan. Yes, she is. Tomorrow. In North Carolina. Tomorrow. She's trolling him. Uh, and her economic plan is actually going to be a plan. I don't know what it is. You can pretty much bank on, uh, you know, that it's going to be uh, something to do with uh, anti-gouging. It's going to be something to do with trust busting. It's going to be something that, uh, you know, uh, actually benefits working people. That increases the opportunity to make better wages. You know that, right? You know that, uh, you know, that's kind of uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. I, I want to show you why we have inflation, okay? Robert Reich, brilliant guy, okay? Former labor secretary, never, ever gives up, never gives up on telling Americans what is going on with America. And what is going on with your pocketbook? What is going on with your wallet? What is going on with your wages? And what is going on with, uh, you know, giant corporations? Are they gouging you? Is this a supply chain issue? Why are prices high? Why are they high? Are they high because there's a, a big demand and a, and a small supply? Or is this something untoward? Is this something ugly? Is there something that you could do legally to stop it? And here is what's going on. Higher wages and government spending don't push up consumer prices. In many cases, mega corporations raise prices to increase their profits. Oh. They can do this because they face such little competition. Oh. Worried about sky-high airfares and lousy service? 
That's largely because airlines have merged from 12 carriers in 1980 to only four today. Oh my God. Concerned about drug prices? Between 1995 and 2015, 60 leading pharmaceutical companies merged to only 10. <gasps> Upset about food costs, four large companies now control 85% of beef processing, 70% of the pork market, and 54% of poultry. Oh my God. Worried about grocery prices? Just three giants, Albertsons, Kroger, and Walmart, control 70% of the grocery sales in 167 cities. Oh my God. Monopolies can raise prices and keep them high because there's not enough competition to charge lower prices and grab their consumers away. Right now, responsibility for fighting inflation lies with the Federal Reserve, which raises interest rates to slow the economy when prices rise. But this causes more unemployment, keeps wages low, and harms many working people. An important way to avoid inflation would be to fight it at the source. Break up monopolies yes. using antitrust laws yes. so that a handful of private companies can't artificially raise prices. Oh! I think I've been saying this forever. And uh, when Robert Reich actually draws it out for you, I think it becomes very, very understandable and easy to comprehend. The reason why grocery prices are so high is because you only have a handful of people controlling everything that's on the shelves, the prices that can be charged on those shelves, selling shelf space to a, another monopoly like, uh, you know, beef, the four beef uh, producers or the four pork producers or the four chicken producers sitting at a table all deciding collectively what they can get away with charging you. And then they have the temerity, they have the nerve, by the way, Kroger's and Albertsons, one of the, the, the and Walmart, those are the three grocery stores. They wanna merge. They wanna merge. So you only have two. What could go wrong? This is the Randy Rhodes Show. Yeah, to speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. All righty. 48 after Gary in Fort Lauderdale. Hello, Randy. Hello, Gary. Got very bad rain here on the roof. I'm having trouble hearing you, so if I say something wrong, let me know. It just went from me to you. It was Pardon me? It, the rain. It just it was it was doing that to my roof too. It was so oh, loud. The lightning lightning was severe too. It was. It was bad. Yeah. So so anyway, with all of these Trump lies that are coming at us at high speed now, as he grows more desperate as time is going on. The thing that's really bothering me is the thing about the no income tax on Social Security payments. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, that's, that's not even viable. So many people receive so much Social Security that not paying tax on that would just be a terrible deficit to the, to the economy. But other than that, he's only doing that to get votes from old people. Well, you know, you, know, no you could do it. You could actually end the taxation on Social Security. We didn't tax Social Security until Ronald Reagan. So mm -hmm. you, could, you could actually do it, but you would have to increase the threshold into which you have to pay into Social Security. So like right now, it stops your obligation to pay into FICA. Stops at 160, you know, more or less dollars, $160,000. So if you actually said uh, everybody's going to pay into Social Security until they, uh, you know. Uh, like 400000 Exactly. Then all of a sudden the people at the bottom of Social Security don't have to pay taxes on and the Social Security. And these people, are, they're never going to notice this. Like the, like these athletes, like the Tua, for example, the guy gets a quarter of a billion dollars to go suck for the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> can, can you imagine how much hey, income tax you're not that guy nice. should be paying? You're not uh, nice. He had didn't he have like m uh, multiple concussions? Yep, yeah, yeah, but he's we're not supposed to feel sorry for him because he had concussions. Yes, we we're are. We're supposed to applaud him because he wins games. No, he can't play in cold weather and he can't <laughs> beat a good team. Other than that, he's wonderful. Yes, I know. <laughs> But anyway, so, so you don't think that Trump is lying about the Social Security business? No, I think Trump wants to get rid of Social Security, and he thinks that <laughs> if you stop taxing Social Security, it would end. Because he yeah. said it. He said it 8 billion times. Here, look, I, I actually had this. I pulled this for today because I intended to talk about this topic. So this is a mashup, uh, it's very short, of uh, Donald Trump saying he wanted to get rid of Social Security and Medicare. One last question. Go ahead. 
entitlements ever be on your plate? Uh, at some point, they will be. We have tremendous growth. We're going to have tremendous growth this well, next year. It'll be toward the end of the year. The growth is going to be incredible. Never happened. And at the right time, we will take a look at that. You know, that's actually the easiest of all things, it's if easy. you look, because it's such if a you're big willing percentage. to do some of the if you, if you don't cut something in entitlements, you'll never really deal with oh, the We'll debt. be cutting, but we're also going to have we'll growth cutting. like you've never had. You changed your your outlook on how to handle entitlement, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Mr. President, it seems like it, it, something has to be done has or to. else we're going to be at a, stuck at 120 percent of, of debt to GDP forever. So first of all, there is a lot you can do in terms of entitlements, in terms of cutting and cutting. Yeah, Gary. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what that statement just reminded me of? What's that? Have you ever heard of that movie called Being There with Peter Sellers? Yes. <laughs> you know what it's about, right? Uh, I forget. He, he was a gardener, wasn't he? he he's, he's a very low IQ gardener yeah, yeah. that lives in a New York City building. Right. And the, his boss dies, and the building gets sold. He gets put out on the street. And he's wearing the fancy clothes that were his bosses. Right. He gets hit by a car by a wealthy woman. She feels terrible about hitting him. She brings him home and nurses him back to health. And she, she happens to know the president of the United States. And he's so vague with his ignorant comments that the president of the United States ends up thinking that he's some kind of a genius. <laughs> and that's, that's how Trump talks. It is how Trump talks. If and you ever watch that, that the movie, you'll see what I'm IQ, talking about. I, I, I have watched that movie. I know that movie. I just uh, couldn't remember how... It progressed, you know what I mean? But I yeah. I remember Peter Sells, uh, you know, being a gardener. I remember him getting hit by a car. I just, uh, whatever. But I'm just saying, look, Donald Trump talks to people as if they're idiots because his his MAGA crowd are idiots. Oh, they, yeah. The only reason why they enjoy him at all, as he decimates their lives. I mean, literally decimates they their lives. They think he's funny. Yes, he's, and he's he hates the same people they hate. Yeah. That's it. That's the yeah. entire appeal. And you know what? Except for the... The core maggots, okay? People are tired of him. Well, I know I am. Randy, I wanted to thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Be okay. well. Stay. Oh, did you hear about Julie? No. Howard didn't tell you? No. She had the surgery three weeks ago, and it sounds like it's a real failure. She's on a walker in a wheelchair, and oh, no. it's really bad, and the guy doesn't have malpractice insurance. and <gasps> it's, we, went, we definitely chose the wrong doctor, you know? Oh, Gary, God, no. Yeah, bad. Get her to physical therapy right away. Right We're away. We're working on that. Get her to physical therapy right away. Thank you, Randy. All right, let me know. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, God. Yeah, Julie and Howard both have, uh, you know, terrible, terrible, terrible back pain, like insanely painful lives, right? My Howard and his Julie. And uh, for the 25 years that we've been talking to each other, we've never met. It's very uh, amazing. But um, Howard has been trying to help Julie figure out what the next thing to do is. And apparently she did the surgery. I, I will say Howard did not. He went with a, a, an implant. He went with a, a machine, okay, that is implanted into you. Anyway, long story short, I have to now follow up with Julie, and Howard has to follow up with Julie because that is the saddest. That is just that is excruciating, excruciating. All right, uh, David in North Carolina. Hey, Randy. Yes. Long, 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 long time listener, first time caller. Yes, I'm a grandma now, apparently. Oh <laughs> God, no, stop. I'm a Can't grandpa, you. so you it's are? not so bad. All right, so we're doing it I together. Am. All right, yeah. fine, great. Yeah. But I'm calling from Asheville, and I just want to tell you what a great town it is. Um, I've heard good things. Uh, yes, I've lived here for, well, we bought our house in 1990. So it was before Asheville became a lovely sort of trendy, blue, yeah, this blue sort of trendy place. Yes, yes. But it, it is definitely, a, it was a blue so bubble back the, here, then. So here's I the mean, issue. Here's the issue. I, I know, I, I've, I've had, you know, um, very, very close friends who have moved from here to there. 
everybody is yeah. do, is doing that now because they 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 absolutely they, they are grandparents and they know that their grandchildren cannot be pregnant here. Okay, it's not safe to have a baby here. <laughs> Truly, it's not right. safe. You right. can't get uh, uh, right. you can't get uh, prenatal care here. If after you're six weeks pregnant, if God forbid something goes wrong, that's it. You'll you're left to bleed out in a parking lot somewhere. So people are, are moving to other places. A lot of people are choosing North Carolina uh, and uh, Asheville in particular because it's like they say uh, what you're saying. It's a beautiful blue bubble. My problem is right. that the land I bought is about two hours east of you, and you know that ain't no blue bubble. East, uh, right, yeah, right, right, yeah. So. I don't live in town, but about three miles north of downtown. Like, I'm sitting outside right now. Yeah. It's 77 degrees. Oh, bite me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like 400% I mean, my partner percent I, humidity here. It's pouring rain and I know. 90 degrees I all mean, at the same time. I know. <laughs> I've lived in South Carolina. I've lived in Georgia. I moved here from Atlanta. Yeah. But my partner and I often say, as we're sitting outside eating dinner, you know, this wouldn't be happening most... It's the most beautiful four season climate in the country. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Okay, go ahead. Because away. elevation and go But away. I'm just highly recommended it to you. Um, I'm sitting here watching mm-hmm. Ernesto praying to God that it turns north, okay? Well, <laughs> hey, we do time to time we'll get remnants of especially if it comes up from the Gulf, we'll get remnants but do you, rain but of do a you, hurricane. But do you flood? You don't flood. Well, not I live high elevation, like on a mountain side north of town. So, no, if we're flooded, then the East Coast is gone. Gotcha, gotcha. But it will, it will flood in town, and there's a couple rivers that, one that flows right through downtown Asheville, and, yeah, it, it will definitely flood. But, um Beautiful place. I I, I, Except, I could only watch come, a little come, bit of. Tr- come for the mountains, stay for the flooding. Okay. Well, no, no. I know. But I, I was just going to say, our our local TV station is owned by Sinclair, unfortunately. Oh, good lord! And I know, really. And I could only watch a little bit of the stream of Trump yesterday before I turned it off. It was um, a lying but, festival of of this, exactly. But it's the same. Well, and, same material. He hasn't even come up with anything new. No. It's just plot. No, he and took out he took out Biden's name. He took out Hillary's name. And he put right. in Kamala's name. And it's the same damn insults. The only thing he doesn't have is It is he doesn't, the, oh, the greatest he, tips. He but keeps he, running for But he doesn't But ha- the, the venue he was at could hold much more people, but I heard that they moved him to the smaller. Yeah. I don't know whether this is true or not. Yeah, he but was at the Wolf There was a bigger part of it. It's like our civic center. But he went to the smaller auditorium. I know. I know. I looked it up. I actually saw what the capacity was. Because uh, I saw it, and I looked at Brett, and I said, Brett, doesn't that look like a school auditorium? Doesn't it look like, uh, you know, the kids are going to do Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star any minute? It was just a small auditorium. <laughs> Mary, how does the book man, 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 man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. Welcome to the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. I love you. Have a great day at school. Dictator on day one. There will have to be some form of punishment for women. Roe versus Wade was terminated. Fire, fury, bloodbath. Now get in. You know what, honey? I'm gonna drive you today. Besides, can convicted felons even drive school buses? <laughs> if you wouldn't trust him with your kid, why would you trust him with your country? Good one. Uh, Eric Swalwell put that out last night on social media, and uh, it was just, uh, it was it was okay. <laughs> it was okay. Uh, but uh, it, it is a good question. It's a wonderful question. If you wouldn't trust him to drive your school bus, and can felons even drive a school bus? I say no. And if you couldn't even get a job driving a school bus, and that's because you are a convicted, soon-to-be-sentenced felon, 34 felonies charged a 
adjudicated guilty, 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 all of them. Uh, how, how come you would uh, trust him with your country? Like, why would you? The man has zero impulse control. I mean, he is so unstable. He's an unstable, not genius. He's an unstable complainer, whiner, whatever you want to call him. I mean, he's dangerous there at this point. He's older. He's more scattered. He doesn't even have, uh, you know, uh, the respect for his followers to even give them a good show. He changes absolutely nothing except the names. The names will change, but the same, uh, it's the same old song. It just plays over and over. The only thing he doesn't have, which is what I was trying to tell uh, our friend in Asheville, is he, he doesn't have the ability to scream lock her up at Kamala, okay? Because Kamala is going to... Uh, actually be the president when he is locked up. She won't do it. She doesn't need to do it. There is no role for the president of the United States to play in the locking up of felons. There is no role for the president to play. That would be the Department of Justice, and her Department of Justice is going to have bigger fish to fry. Her Department of Justice is going to have to do the trust busting. Her Department of Justice is going to have to do the end of price gouging. And guess what? She is up for it. CNBC today is reporting that Vice President Kamala Harris is going to propose the first ever federal ban on corporate price gouging in the food industry, and we'll probably get that announcement tomorrow at the same exact, uh, well, it'll be uh, in North Carolina tomorrow, uh, so that she controlled Donald Trump with his bullcrap. You know, Donald Trump uh, and, and uh, J.D. Vance really need to, uh, you know, talk to each other a little bit. Maybe they need to, uh, you know, appear here together or something because one is saying they want to get rid of the Affordable Care Act and the other one is saying they don't. And uh, it's very confusing except to say that Donald Trump yesterday, yesterday in uh, North Carolina and uh, said that in Nashville, he said that he... If he found something, this was very, uh, you know, I mean, this is how Donald Trump does. Okay, this is what he does. He says two things at the same time. He says he's for and against something at the same time, right? So that whatever happens, he was right. He was right. And people just sit there and marvel. Like, how is he always right? Because he hedges, okay? He says he's for the Affordable Care Act. But if he found something better than the Affordable Care Act, he would get rid of the Affordable Care Act and replace it with that. Now, what's really fascinating is this man has had nine years to think about that, and he still isn't able to tell you whether or not he has come up with something better than the Affordable Care Act or what it might look like or what it might taste like or what it might be. I mean, the only, the only thing I know he, he's ever said about health care is we should find a way to get the dis disinfectant inside the body, some way to do that, because you see the virus gets knocked out in a minute. And shouldn't we find a way to uh, get that inside the body? You know what I'm saying? Uh, so uh, yesterday he said that he wants to preserve the Affordable Care Act unless, <laughs> unless there was something better and he could offer you something better, which sounds uh, great until you realize he's had almost nine years to think about that and come up with something, and he never has, and he never will. He never will. So, um, you know, his whole thing is to savage government. His whole thing is to destroy every single program, every single uh, subsidy, every single uh, tax credit that benefits working families, every single one of those things, including collective bargaining around prescription drugs and including collective bargaining around wages. Wages. You know what was really fascinating to me? The Teamsters Union guy, remember him? He went to the Republican National Convention, which nobody can even remember now except for Hulk Hogan ripping off some shirt. Uh, it's like a really uh, geriatric guy just ripping off his shirt and, uh, you know, like watching his uh, bat wings in the wind just blow back and forth with muscles on top of him. It was a very interesting look. It was a very uh, odd choice. But, okay, they made it. And... So nobody can remember this convention except for the um, thing where they're like going to um, get rid of all of these things that help working families. And then the Teamsters guy, the president of the Teamsters Union, actually appears there. And so it seems as if 
the Teamsters Union is in on the union busting. Except that it happens this the guy, I forget his name, O'Brien, I don't know. He, he's the president of the Teamsters. He goes to the Republican National Convention. Very few people even remember that he was there, but I do, okay? And he says that, um, that the Republican Party supports unions or whatever. And then, like, the next day, Donald Trump is talking to Elon Musk on this, uh, you know, um, two-hour-long whatever that was. It was a campaign donation is what it was. It was a virtual campaign event that actually violated the law, the one law that we have around campaign finance. Well, we have two. We have two laws around campaign finance. We have the one that says that you can't take foreign money, which Donald Trump already did, and we have the one that says corporations can't directly give to a campaign, which Elon Musk just did in front of everybody, in front of everybody's face, in front of millions of people's faces, okay? Sean O'Brien, that's his name. So Sean O'Brien got on the stage, and he was saying, oh, you know, it's not true that they'll bust union. The next day, he's on this uh, thing with Elon, and he's, they're laughing. They're laughing at working people. They're saying, I like the way you do it. You go in there and you fire everybody. You say, oh, you want to go on strike? You want to go on strike? Okay, you're fired. Don't come back. You don't work here anymore. That's intimidation of any organiz- organized uh, you know, labor or any, any uh, not ability, but any uh, attempt to organize in the workplace. None of that is illegal. None of that, what's illegal is the intimidation of that activity, which is totally permitted by law, even in right-to-work states, which this Florida one is. Um, And so now the UAW is uh, suing him. That aside, now Sean O'Brien, who's been shown to look ridiculous by doing that that appearance at the Republican National Convention, is now being, uh, you know, uh, looked at for replacement by his own union members because they are outraged that he would go to the Republican National Convention, support the guy who laughs and says, if you strike, I will fire you. So now they're looking to replace him. And I will tell you that um, the uh, there's a black caucus inside the Teamsters Union. And the black caucus inside the Teamsters Union organized themselves away from Sean O'Brien's position, and they've endorsed Kamala Harris. So it looks like Sean O'Brien opened up, he, 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 he ran a mouth so bad that, you know, now he's, uh, he's going to get fired. And, you know, who deserves it more than he does for going there and supporting that, that, that scab? Over two people, Biden and Harris, who both joined strikers on the picket line. What was he thinking? It's Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. And get this. You may have heard about the MAGA Republican Project 2025 plan. <laughs> They want to repeal Medicare's power to negotiate drug prices. Yep. Let Big Pharma back to charge them whatever they want. Yep. Let me tell you what our Project 2025 is. (laughs) Beat the hell out of them. (laughs) I mean it. Joe Biden has absolutely no Fs to give anymore. He's just going to say what it is that he has been uh, bottled up uh, and not saying. Uh, look, the, the, the idea that everything about them is to destroy our way of uh, trying to live a life is, uh, you know, an understatement, really. Everything in that Project 2025 thing, everything, including the trainings where they're telling people, so listen, if you're, uh, if you're not willing to break the law, if you're not willing to, uh, you know, like risk your reputation, your ability to work, your ability to, uh, you know, uh, even drive a school bus in the future, uh, then sit this one out. I mean, this is in their training videos. They know what they're proposing is illegal. They know what they're proposing is uh, not popular. They know what they're proposing would be a, a, a destruction of working families. It would be a, a, a staffing of the American government with nothing but yes men for a, a guy like Donald Trump, partisan 
yes men, and no, not anybody would be allowed to work in our government. That was for the ending of price gouging or who was willing to do antitrust uh, you know, uh, 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 actions in the Justice Department. They understand that if they lose now, if, if, if the Republican, well, there's no Republican Party, if Donald Trump, th- they bet the whole farm on Donald Trump, okay? And this is why, this is why, you may wonder, like, why, why is there no daylight between even the moderates and the, and the wildly conservatives? How come there's no daylight between the liberal Republicans, the moderate Republicans, and MAGA? Why is there... Because they have bet the entirety of uh, the next, oh, I'll say eight years of their lives in government, of their lives in the House of Representatives, in the United States Senate, in the White House, in business, in taxation uh, issues, matters of taxation, in negotiations. They've bet it all, all on a madman. They've bet it all on a lunatic. They've bet it all on a fringy guy. But they did. But they did. And so now they're all in or they, uh, you know, uh, they, they actually try and grab a lifeline and get. And that is why you're seeing so many Republicans for Kamala Harris. You're seeing the only the only smart people, the only decent people left in the Republican Party, the only people who actually have said something about the illness that is Donald Trump, about the metastasizing cancer that that man is on our democracy. So you have, um, you know, some of the people who got out early, like the Adam Kinzingers, believe it or not, the Liz Cheney's of the world, who I have nothing else in common with her, nothing at all in common with her. You know, her, her family, her dad, the whole bit, the the way she treated her sister when it counted. I mean, there's nothing we have in common except an agreement that this man is poison, that this man is dangerous, that this man is irresponsible, that this man, I mean, more irresponsible than two wars? Yes, more irresponsible than two wars, okay? That this man is a driver of the civil war in this country, that people will do it for him. They will kill their brothers. They will kill their sisters. They will kill their mothers. They will kill their neighbors for him. It's a small minority of people, a small minority, but they, they will do it. And they always start with, I don't want to do it. I don't want it, but I'll kill everyone. Who, I don't believe Who them. said that? No, just, you, I hear it all the time from, from, from the right wing gun nuts, the MAGA people with the. I, w- you know, I don't want to, but I, I will it kill always you. It starts with, I don't, not me personally, but. I don't want to. It's the last thing I want. I'd hate for it to come to this, but I'll kill people. It's what you hear every time, and I just don't believe them. you got to get a different crowd, man. Every time you weigh in on, like, the people you're hanging with or talking to or, or hearing stuff from, it's always like, you know, it's like an apocalyptic. This, this one actually is a particular friend of mine that I, that I have that I've known for a handful of years, and we can hang out because we're adults, but he has very far-right proclivities, and this is one of his favorite rants once we've had a few, which is, you know, I train and I don't want to, but I'll kill people. Okay, so that guy, uh, if, if, if he was anywhere in my orbit, if I knew his name, if I had any interaction with this guy, I, 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 would, I would say that's why we need a red flag law. And I would turn his ass in. Anybody that's threatening to kill people in a casual setting is not a responsible gun owner. I'm so sorry. But that guy is a guy who, when Donald Trump loses, could actually end up somewhere inside of a church or a school doing something. And you're, you're nodding, yes, yes, you're in agreement. So you have to, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, tell somebody about that before we read about him. And you go, that's the guy. I'm not turning him in. It's probably Oh, bluster. I would. It's probably bluster. But... It, the, the, with the ease, like you said, the comfortability with which he says these things is a lot. What I'm saying to you is that there are old white men who are, you know, uh, without a, a, any direction anymore, you know, who are just uh, floating around. They call them, uh, what does he call them, the front row Joes? Uh, they go to tons and tons and tons of Trump rallies, okay? They, they, they are there all the time. They travel the whole reason for They're like deadheads gone bad, they're like deadheads who took the brown acid, okay? These are the people that just checked out a long time ago, 
uh, and follow Donald Trump. And once it's not a possibility anymore, once he's not a possibility anymore, these guys are going to go one of two ways. They're either going to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show and say, I did everything I could and there's nothing left for me to do. Now I'm just going to, you know, go fishing. Or they're going to just split apart, implode, and do bad things. And uh, that's what I'm afraid of. That's what Donald Trump is counting on. That's the stand back, stand by thing. But these are the front row Joes. These are the people that are so committed to him that they would actually destroy their families. They would actually do it. And we've seen it because we've seen, uh, you know, people apologize to their kids, okay, for doing bad things because of Donald Trump. We've already seen it. You know, we saw that, uh, that young man, I forget what year it was. I mean, there's been a lot of people like that who, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, trying to turn his father in because he knew his dad was going to do something for Donald Trump. And I'm telling you right now that if you know somebody like that and, uh, you know, uh, push comes to shove and Donald Trump loses and you see them splitting apart, you see them imploding on themselves, you see them reaching for, you know, uh, their stash of of, uh, 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 ammo, you need to call somebody. I'm serious. You need to report. You need to actually. Now, it not won't it won't do you a whole bit of good in uh, Florida because we don't have red flag laws. So, but anyway, that went down a really ugly road because it became very personal all of a sudden. Like uh, this this crowd you run around with scares the bejesus out of me. Yeah, but you said something about this guy and that guy. And this guy. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy. Call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Okay. Here's two completely normal people talking uh, in a very normal way to each other about normal things. One of my dear friends um, tonight said to me, well, the, all these suburban women, uh, said, all these suburban women, all they care about is abortion and they don't understand that decision is with the states now. It's not banned nationally, even if, if people, some people want it to be banned nationally. It's with the states. What do you say to suburban women out there who are, are marinating in this propaganda? Huh? Well, first of all, I don't buy that, Laura. I think most suburban women care about the normal things that most Americans care about. Um, you're insane, both of you, to, to try and tell women that they're not dying in parking lots because in Florida, after six weeks, if you need uh, prenatal care, you can't get it because doctors are leaving the state because they can't practice uh, uh, obst- obstetrics here. Are you insane telling people that it's not normal for women of childbearing years to worry about where, what state they live in now so that they can have families safely and with medical guidance along the way? I mean, Laura Ingram, the nerve of her, really, I mean, it's not like she's ever uh, naturally given birth. Not that, you know, uh, this matters. It, it shouldn't. But to listen to her tell me that normal women don't worry about getting uh, prenatal care when they're pregnant in states that ban prenatal care, if it includes a DNC because the pregnancy is not viable, or if it includes uh, your water broke uh, uh, during your 15th week and you need an abortion, you need to actually be helped out at the hospital because you will become septic. Laura Ingram adopted all her children. Laura Ingram has never had a natural pregnancy. Laura Ingram doesn't have a husband. So why is she talking to J.D. Vance about what traditional uh, 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 childbearing age women are worried about? As if she would know. First of all, she's a multimillionaire for just sitting there and being, uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of an Eva Braun propagandist. Okay, that's all she does is lie all day, every day on TV for a living. Every time I've ever seen her, she's not been sober. And now uh, she's uh, dictating to women who want to have uh, families 
where and when they can and that if they're, are, they're in a state like Alabama or Florida, they shouldn't even worry about what could happen to them because that's not normal in her world. I mean, this is really sick. And then on the other end of it, J.D. Vance in 2020 was on um, a podcast. Now, that sounds innocuous enough, right, until you realize who the podcast host was. The podcast host was the chairman of uh, Peter Thiel's um, investment firm. And it wasn't enough, you know, so like uh, that's kind of a boring. He needed to have a podcast too, okay? So this guy actually interviewed J.D. Vance. Why? Because Peter Thiel funded J.D. Vance's entire political life. Like the reason why J.D. Vance is a senator is because of Peter Thiel giving him millions, tens of millions of dollars to run and be a senator, okay? So he's on this guy who is the chairman of uh, uh, Peter Thiel's uh, you know, investment fund. And he's talking to J.D. Vance about the role of his mother-in-law, swear to God, the role of J.D. Vance's Indian mother-in-law in their lives, in their lives, because he has nothing else to talk about, right? And J.D. Vance is going to agree with the host that postmenopausal women like his mother-in-law, the only, and she, she teaches biology, I think. I, I, she's, she does something, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure if she teaches biology or if she is a biologist uh, or both. But his mother-in-law is a woman of uh, intellect, okay? She's, she's an accomplished woman. And they have decided that the only role she can play is to be babysitter because she's postmenopausal. And that's the only role for po- postmenopausal women. And you can sort of see the effect it has on him to be around them. Like they spoil him. There's sort of all the classic stuff that grandparents do to grandchildren. But it. Do to grandchildren? I, I don't think grandparents do anything to grandchildren. I think they do things with grandchildren, but anyway. Makes him a much better human being to have exposure to his grandparents. Well, I don't know. And, and the evidence on this, by the way, is like super clear. That's the whole purpose of the postmenopausal yes. female in, in theory. Did your in-laws, and particularly your mother-in-law, show up in some huge way? She lived with us for a year. Right. So, you know. So error, I didn't know the answer to that. Right. No. Because so, that's, so, that's yeah. this weird, unadvertised feature of marrying an Indian woman. It's, it, yeah, I, it's in some ways the most transgressive thing I've ever done against <laughs> sort of the, 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 the hyper neoliberal approach to, yeah. to work and family. This is what rich guys sit around and talk about, okay? Uh, and this guy actually had the nerve to tell J.D. Vance that the only role a postmenopausal woman has is in taking care of grandchildren. And he said, you know, he's like, uh, I didn't know this, so I'm just going to ask, did your mother-in-law actually do, uh, did she show up in a big way uh, after you had uh, some children? He's like, she came and lived with us for a year. Well, see, that's the benefit of marrying an Indi- into an Indian family. What the, what kind of conversation is this? This is like super ugly on every level. It's ageist. It's misogynistic and it's racist. It's the trifecta of a conversation you should be embarrassed about. And they're not. So this was one of Peter Thiel's guys vetting J.D. Vance to see if he could put up with it. I'm guessing the racist act, you know, the, and, and, and he's like, you know, go ahead, make fun of my family. Go ahead, go ahead and tell Tell me that, you know, um, it's an odd feature of marrying an Indian woman. Go ahead and tell me that. Um, so Jewish mothers don't get involved in their grandchildren's lives in a uh, big way. Black mothers don't, grandma doesn't get involved. Aunties don't get involved. I mean, what the F? What is this, what is this theory that these billionaires have about what we do every day? to raise families. I, I just, it's, it's so vile, it's so disgusting. So on the front end, you have uh, women of childbearing age who should not think about, don't ever think about uh, whether or not you can get prenatal care in your state. 
It's just, you know, if you're thinking about that, there's something wrong with you. You need to worry about the price of groceries and nothing else. And then on the back end, if you're a postmenopausal woman, the only thing left for you, the only role for you to play in their um, white Christian nationalist breeding program is to raise the children. Fatality. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. Yeah. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Oh, he's out there again. He, 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 he has walked outside of his, um, his Bedminster Golf Club to speak about inflation and food prices. Like he, he, like he understands what a $148 increase in your grocery bill means to you, as if he's ever been in a grocery store. I mean, th- it's just so sad. Anyway, he's spreading the same stupid lies. So the be- I handed them the best economy. No, Obama handed you the best economy. And then you literally froze on COVID. We had the strongest economy in history. No. There's never been a country that had an economy like us. Oh. I gave Harris and Biden an economic miracle and they quickly turned it into an economic nightmare. See, this is an oft repeated claim by Donald Trump that he had the strongest economy of all time. And now he's adding he handed Joe Biden an economic <laughs> miracle. What's the truth about that? Uh, not only did he not have the strongest economy. economy of all time, he didn't even have the strongest economy of the last two presidents, oh. himself and Joe Biden. <laughs> and so let's take a look at some of the facts here. First, the strongest measure, the best measure of an economy is its growth rate, uh, GDP growth rate. And so when you compare the two, and I have adjusted out COVID in fairness to both presidents, although you see it doesn't actually change the picture. Trump grew his economy at a rate of about 2.6% a year, which is actually not a bad rate, and uh, and that excludes COVID. Biden grew his economy, has grown so far his economy, at 3.5% a year. Uh If you take out the effects of COVID, the disparity is even greater. So I've done this as uh, honestly as I can do, no matter how you do it, it doesn't come out in Trump's favor, even against Biden, let alone against 5,000 years of other economies around the world. Uh, Secondly, you can look at jobs. That's a very important thing in an economy, obviously, to Americans. And again, I've adjusted out the effects of COVID. 182,000 jobs on average a month created by Trump. 271,000 jobs on average created by by Biden. Again, if you take out COVID, the disparity is far greater. So (laughs) that is one of his most preposterous claims. And he's making it again. And, and again, here's the numbers, okay? Uh, Donald Trump's unemployment when he left office, okay, 4.7%. Um, so uh, right now it's what, like uh, 3, 3.5, something like this? Okay, GDP under Donald Trump grew 2.6. 2.6. Under Biden, 3.5%. He just told you that. Home prices have increased under Donald Trump by 27.5%. The trade deficit under Donald Trump increased. Remember all this trade stuff, all these tariffs that, by the way, you pay, you pay. And yesterday he was talking about not just 10% tariffs on everything that comes into this country from any other country. He's saying 20% tariffs on anything that comes into this country from anywhere outside this country. You pay that, you will pay 20% more for anything that has a tariff of 20% on it. Okay, the trade deficit, in spite of his brilliance, his stable genius on, uh, you know, guiding us through trade deals, the trade deficit increased by 36% under Donald Trump. The debt was $14 trillion. Under Donald Trump, when he left, it was $21.6 trillion. That was the most any president had ever added to the debt. The murder rate was the highest it ever was. The murder rate was the highest uh, that it had been uh, through 1997. The economy shed 2.7 million jobs. Coal production declined by 26%. Jobs declined by 25%. Three million Americans lost health insurance coverage. Income grew under Barack Obama by $5,000 a year, and under Donald Trump, income grew by $1,400 a year. That is, by in no way, shape, or form did he have the best economy of any president ever. He didn't even have the biggest tax cut of any president ever, 
But the majority of his tax cut went to the top 87%, who he said it would trickle down, and instead they did stock buybacks, and it never trickled down. So everything that he does is the same old trickle-down economic theory that has never worked, will never work, doesn't work. Tomorrow we'll hear uh, Kamala Harris's economic plan, but I promise you it's going to include trust busting. It's going to include any business that isn't pricing fairly, any business whose pricing is not being done based on the cost of doing business. Any, any business that is jacking up prices just because they can is going to dread and work tirelessly and feverishly to prevent a Kamala Harris presidency. Just know that. Just know that. But that if she actually used the antitrust power that the government has, the ability to break up giant monopoly, monopolies and mon, mon, I can't even say it, monopolistic practices, if you let somebody who gives a damn and somebody who's a great prosecutor, somebody who has prosecuted fraud, somebody who has prosecuted price fixing, somebody who has prosecuted drug cartels, somebody who has prosecuted all the things that you say are problems for you and for this country, if you elected somebody who had experience feeding back that kind of thing, you would see it in a grocery, grocery bill. That's just a fact. You would see it in home prices. That's just a fact. You would see it in the economy, uh, you know, the greater economy. And that's just a fact. So tomorrow she's having a campaign rally uh, in uh, North Carolina. And uh, we'll see. I'm not going to play any of Donald Trump's uh, crazy thing that he's doing right now. He hasn't even changed his clothes. He's wearing exactly the same thing he wore yesterday. Standing in front of his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey. Talking about the lar- he's doing it right now. I can read it on the Chiron. He's talking about the largest tax cut in our nation's history. The largest tax cut in our nation's history. Um, that did not happen. He did not do a tax cut that was the largest in our nation's history. And all of the tax cut that he gave never paid for itself. It was used to buy back stocks from the already elite billionaires in this country. It never trickled down to you. And uh, it's now on our tab. It's now on our debt tab. Doug in Washington. Randy. Yes. So people, buy a stinking podcast. Thank you. Number one. Number two, thanks for talking about relaunching the show and your book yesterday. Oh. I've been thinking about your book and you talking about it when you relaunched the show, and then we hadn't heard anything about it forever. Right. It's just sitting so, on my computer. <laughs> well, let's fix that, because your Kickstarter to relaunch the show raised a buck and a half, probably should have been 250 Let's either do a Kickstarter or just pre-sell the book. Oh. Because you can self-publish that book, and if you move 5,000 copies in the first day, and sure, you sure as hell can pre-sell 5,000 copies, you're on the New York Times bestseller list. Then you get a publisher. Oh. And there's a business model for it because working man millionaire Mike Rowe uh, launched his mom's writing career by self-publishing her first book, and now Doubleday is her publisher for her fourth book. Well, that's wonderful, uh, but he has name recognition beyond uh, you know anything I could count on, and that is why publishers didn't want to publish the book. They all loved it. I mean, people told me this was this book was uh, you know just uh, one one publisher, uh, one uh, you know person, uh, an editor, or I forget what her job title is, the, the person that reads it for the imprint, for the publisher. She said she sat and read it in one sitting. It was that good, okay? And still they won't publish it. So uh, it's, I'm not Mike Rowe. <laughs> well, no, you're not. But you can. You have a platform. I mean, we paid to put you on a platform. Use yeah. it. Free sell the book. Ay, all right. I'll buy it. In fact, I'll take the money we were going to use to rent an apartment and move to a red state to vote. <laughs> oh, that's who you are. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, no, let's, don't. let's do this. Let's not. <laughs> oh, come on. No. 
All right. Well, thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. And sooner or later, I'm going to read the damn book. All right. Uh, Nancy in Washington. Hey, Randy. Hi. I was talking, uh, listening to your conversation with Brett about, you know, the MAGA guy. The thing is, they're cowards. One six happened because they knew that the fix was in and that Trump was going to tell no National Guard and tell the cops to stand down. And that's why they were so brazen. But this time, Biden's going to be in office and there's going to be cops with riot gear. There's going to be National Guard. And they know that they're not going to get pardoned. So I don't think that I think it's going to fizzle. I hope you're right. I really do. I hope that they're just spinning their wheels, that there is no pushback when he loses. I believe he's going to lose. When I listened to Frank Luntz, which we started the show with today, tell me now we can actually start thinking about having the House and the Senate. (laughs) 